Hello, my name is Katrin Finas. I'm a postdoc at Örebro University in Sweden and the University of Manitoba in Canada. And I am presenting my work about the characterization of contaminants in the Canadian Arctic marine environment. A little bit about the background and motivation. Um, the Arctic is considered a global sink for pollutants. So that means um, pollutants can travel from more southern regions up north and accumulate there. And among these pollutants are not only known contaminants, but also unknown compounds and degradation or transformation products, which is why I'm doing an untargeted screening. Within the Arctic, um, pollutants can travel between the water, biota, and sediment compartment. And also within the biota um, compartment, they can um, enrich in higher trophic level species, um, which is called biomagnification. The overall objective of the project is to identify unknown organic pollutants in the Canadian Arctic. And I'm using different prioritization techniques, including, for example, to compare the different matrices, water, sediment, biota, looking at biomagnification or looking at spatial trends. The samples for the study were collected in the Canadian Arctic in Hudson's Bay area. And I was on a sampling cruise starting in Carl Harbor here and going through the inlet to Baker Lake and then south along the coast to Arviat. And we collected water, sediment and biota samples throughout the cruise. The water samples were collected in these stainless steel coke cans. Um, in total, nine high volume water samples, 300 liters were collected for each sample and then th filtered through an XAD sorbent. Um, in total, 16 sediment samples were collected using the box core shown in the picture there and 78 biota samples using a bottom trawl. And the biota samples contained different types of species from different stations. Water samples were extracted using a solvent extraction with DCM for the XAD phase, uh, followed by a liquid-liquid extraction for the remaining water phase. Sediment and biota were extracted both using microwave extraction with hexane acetone. Um, for sediment samples, sulfur was removed with activated copper, and for biota, lipids were removed using gel permeation chromatography. All samples were then analyzed using comprehensive two-dimensional gas chromatography coupled to high-resolution time-of-flight mass spectrometry with the 30-meter nonpolar column in the first dimension and the semipolar column in the second dimension. The modulation period was six seconds, and each sample was analyzed in triplicate. We also did stable isotope analysis um, to get an idea about the tropic level of the biota species we had. All samples were then aligned in the software Guinea. And the first step was to remove artifacts. And those are compounds that only appear in one out of the three replicates. After that, I removed compounds that had high concentrations in the blanks and applied a detection frequency threshold of 20%. So I started with more than 42,000 compounds and ended up with around 500 compounds. And those 500 compounds were then subjected to principal component analysis, PCA using centered, scaled, and log transformed data. Um, among having um, higher peak capacity and better separation, another um, advantage of 2DGC is being able to apply classifications. So this is a combination of um, defining regions in the 2D chromatogram and applying spectral filters. And I did this for the compound groups here on the left. For phthalates and halogenated compounds, only spectral filters were applied. And for all the others in the list, um, I also applied the regions as they're shown in the um, chromatogram on the right hand side here. So this is an example chromatogram um, just with the, the peak markers. And if I apply the classifications, we can see that already um, some of the compounds um, are classified. And I used these results further on. So now to the results for the PCAs. Um, we can see here a um, comparison of the three matrices. Um, we have sediment samples in red, water samples in blue, and biota samples in green. And we can see that the sediment samples cluster together as do the water samples, which means they are similar to each other in their chemical composition. 
Um, the biota samples, however, are kind of all over the place, um, which means they are, um, have a very different um, chemical composition, which makes sense because it's different types of species from different stations. So here I analyze the biota sample separately now. And we can see that we have different clusters forming. So for example, we have three clusters with shrimps, one in the middle, one to the left hand side, and one in the upper corner. And uh, samples located within each cluster are similar to each other in their chemical composition. And the shrimp cluster on the upper hand side also contains the eggs, shrimp eggs that were collected. Then we also have two clusters for different types of fish. And for example, the fish cluster on the bottom left um, contains sculpins only. So these fish are, um, again, similar to each other in their chemical composition. And then we have some smaller clusters, um, for example, here in the top part of the um, PCA plot um, with Acidiaceae, um, brittle stars, and sponges. And these are generally um, species that have uh, are at lower trophic levels, and they also cluster together. If we now look at the compounds in relation to this, um, we can see that compounds that have a high second dimension retention time, which are here um, colored in purple, are more on the bottom right hand side. And if we go back, we can see that the uh, um, species located at the bottom right hand side were fish species here. So these fish have higher concentrations of um, compounds that have a high second dimension retention time. And since the semipolar column was applied, the second dimension retention time is loosely correlated to polarity. So more polar compounds are more abundant in fish as an example here. If we now um, look at the water and sediment sample separately, um, as I said before, water clusters together as do the sediment samples. We do have a few outlier for the sediment samples though, but we can look at spatial trends here. We have some samples collected in the inlet, and again, the inlet samples cluster together for the water and sediment. And the same goes for open water samples and also for coastal water samples. If we look at the um, compounds here in relation to the samples, and these compounds on the left-hand plot are colored by retention index, we can see that um, compounds with a low retention index are um, mostly located in the upper left corner, and those was, were um, where the sediment samples collected in the inlet were also located, which means um, the sediment samples there had high concentration of low boiling compounds because low retention index um, correlates to low boiling compounds. If we now look at the um, classification results, um, unfortunately there are not too many groupings visible. But we can see that alkanes, which are um, marked by red, um, sorry, black circles, um, are mostly located on the left-hand side of the plot. That means sediment samples have higher concentrations of alkanes than water samples, which makes sense because alkanes are highly unpolar, um, as are the sediment samples. Um, for the other compound groups, unfortunately, there are not too many um, groupings visible. Uh, we can see a few fatty acids and phthalates um, have maybe higher concentrations in water samples, but it's not too distinct patterns. So overall we saw that um, there is a difference in chemical composition between the matrices, between the biological species, and between the station types. Um, and the next steps will be to identify the remaining compounds and to do effect-directed analysis to look at toxicity as a prioritization tool for identification. With that, I'm at the end of my presentation and I thank the crew of the William Kennedy and also my funding sources. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me.